Greetings, everyone. I call the room to order. I can. Doesn't work so well, does it? Seem to have the right effect. Greetings, everyone. My name's Russell Gruen. I'm the Dean of the College of Health and Medicine at the Australian National University. On behalf of all of us here, gathered for this afternoon's Mitchell oration, I acknowledge the Ngunnawal and the Ngambri people. As the traditional owners of the lands in which we're gathered, I pay respect to their elders past and present, and I acknowledge the significance of country for all First Nations people everywhere within reach of this broadcast. Whenever we gather together to discuss progress, development, well-being and dignity, it serves us well to remind ourselves that there are many lessons to learn from First Nations people, not least of which is how culture and country and body, mind and spirit fit together in a full sense of social and emotional well-being. May we all be open to looking to see, to listening to hear and to learning to understand. The Mitchell Orations Lecture Series, established in 2012 with the support of Harold Mitchell Foundation, is designed to create a unique forum where eminent thinkers and practitioners converge to discuss and propose solutions to some of the most critical development challenges of our time. Harold Mitchell, the visionary behind the foundation that bears his name, is renowned for his philanthropy and his commitment to driving transformative change. His keen insight into the power of collaborative thought leadership has led to the inception of this influential lecture series, fostering dialogue that shapes policy and impacts lives in Australia and across the region. Over the past two days, this conference has effectively highlighted diverse perspectives on localisation and community-driven development. It has showcased examples and identified areas that demand further effort. The consensus is clear. We need to keep moving forward. Yet, given today's global challenges, the question remains. How can we expedite progress and ensure that our actions are both effective and timely. It is my honour to introduce, by inviting to the podium, Professor Esperanza Martinez, who will offer a human-centric approach to these questions. Informed by her direct experience in conflict and crisis zones, the early part of her career was in global health and health security and encompass field work across the globe in Colombia, Kosovo, Angola, East Timor and Nepal. She then joined the International Committee of the Red Cross in Geneva in 2015, where she directed the health portfolio as head of health across 80 countries, including conflict zones in Afghanistan, Yemen, South Sudan and Lebanon. Her leadership was pivotal during the COVID-19 pandemic and in the humanitarian response in the Russia-Ukraine conflict. As a thought leader, she also advises several organisations, including the WHO Foundation and the Global Health Centre of the Geneva Graduate Institute. Currently, Professor Martinez is Head of Health and Human Security here at the Australian National University, leading a transdisciplinary agenda that is critical for our human future. I now give, invite her to give her address, which is entitled Disentangling Localisation and Imperative to Uphold Human Dignity. Esperanza. Thank you very much, Ross. And thank you everyone from being, for being here and to all of you who are listening online. As we are in Canberra, I also would like to begin by acknowledging and paying my respect to the Ngunnawal and the Nambri people on whose traditional lands we meet, 
learn and work, and whose culture is among the oldest continuing cultures in human history. Before I delve into the subject, allow me to tell you a little bit of how my upbringing has influenced the way I see the world. I was born and grew up in Colombia, at the time when the country was engulfed in a wide-ranging armed conflict. My mother, against all odds, completed her high school and university studies when she already had three children. For all purposes, she was also a single mother. My sisters and I always had a roof on our heads and most of the time food on our plates, but knew no luxury. But despite the constraints, we were able to dream and move forward because we were never told that there were things we could not do. The ability to do, the freedom of humans to act disregarding of the circumstances they face, and how this is closely tied up with human dignity will be the focus of my talk today. Fast forward to my career, I found myself in Kosovo for my first international humanitarian deployment. The war, which took place from February 1998 to June 1999, caused over 10,000 deaths and displaced around 1.5 million ethnic Albanians from their homes. As a medical doctor, I was responsible for training medical teams in trauma care and for delivering services and basic assistance to people displaced from their homes. Before the NATO bombing campaign against Yugoslavia, I traveled with the team to Tirana, the capital of Albania, to assist Kosovo refugees hosted in temporary camps. One bitterly cold morning, as I made my way down a muddy path, I saw a group of men in their 60s huddled around a tiny fire pit and looking particularly dejected. There are, of course, many reasons to be sad and sorrowful when you have been just displaced from your home by bombardments, shelling, and killings. Yet, this group had an expression I had not seen before. Accompanied by my translator, I approached them to ask about their concern. Speaking almost in unison, they said, we are all bakers, and very good ones for that matter. And here, all we do is wait each day for a truck to deliver a sliced bread made in a factory and wrapped in plastic for us to feed our families. This is not what we need. All we need is an oven and flour so we can feed our families ourselves. These men were not speaking of food security. They were yearning to reclaim their self, the sense of self-worth and purpose. Their roles within their families and their communities, their very dignity had been stripped away, not only by the war, but also by the way in which aid was being delivered to them. Human dignity in this context refers to the ability to exercise autonomy and the right to actively participate in one's own development, a principle that aligns with the United Nations Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Contrarily, what I witnessed was a dependency and a profound lack of control over one's lives among these men. It goes without saying, none of the humanitarian agencies working in Kosovo or the surrounding countries had, at that time, flexible budget lines to set up even a rudimentary bakery. Furthermore, a prevalent view back then, and one that persists in many countries today, is that helping refugees or internally displaced persons become self-sufficient could encourage their prolonged stay. Sadly, this perspective fails to consider the deep invisible wounds that the loss of dignity inflicts on humans, the transgenerational trauma that follows when children witness their father or mother crumble under the weight of impotence. In the human spirit lies a fundamental urge to act in the face of adversity. Encoded within us is the fight or flight response 
a survival instinct that usually overrides inaction. While we may sometimes migrate by inertia, it is our inherent drive to act that prevails. Disasters, war, and social injustices trigger our deepest survival mechanisms, compelling us to stand helping hand and stand for those in need, often at the risk of our own safety and well-being. It is this innate impulse to act and protect that stands as a testament to our profound sense of solidarity and care, a testament to our humanity. As a newly graduated medical doctor in Colombia, I was required to perform what is still called mandatory rural service. This assignment took me to the Amazonian jungle, to a, a territory where armed conflict, cocaine production, and a stark lack of basic development all coalesced. There, I met a young man who had been wounded while fighting for a guerrilla group. I had the opportunity to ask him about his motivation for joining the insurgency. He told me he was the only son of a family of five, living on a farm with his father and sisters. His mother had died in childbirth a few years prior. One day, some guerrilla fighters came to the farm and walked away with their cows. This family was, like many other Colombians living in remote locations, barely putting food on the table. Losing their cows was therefore a significant blow. They knew that animal theft was rampant, as fighters in the conflict needed food. However, having been raised by his father to believe in justice and the importance of doing the right thing, the son convinced the elderly man to report the theft at the nearest police station. Later, as he recounted the story to me, tears welled up in his eyes while he described how, instead of finding support, they were met with accusations of colluding with the rebel forces. When his frail father stood up and re to rebuke those claims, the policeman man in the station slapped him on the face and the man fell to the floor. A few weeks later, this young man walked deep into the jungle and joined the insurgency. The drive to do something, to symbolically repair the dignity that had been stripped away from his father was more powerful than his sense of justice or even his sense of survival. Many of you listening today have been deployed to humanitarian crises or have worked in low resource settings or with, communi uh, with communities enduring significant vulnerabilities. Without a doubt, you have your own stories that underscore the innate human need to take action and the importance of preserving dignity. I urge you to ponder the following questions. Are we doing everything possible to provide a space for the most at-risk individuals and communities to do, to act? Are we creating opportunities for them to be the architects of their own destiny regardless of their adversities? Are we truly localizing aid in a way that upholds human dignity? The concepts that inform localization, such as community-driven development and local capacity building, are not new and have been part of the development discourse for decades. Yet, for many years, top-down strategies and international-led intervention have been the norm. It was only in the early 2000s that the development and humanitarian communities began to advocate more vigorously for initiatives led by local actors in recognition that local knowledge, expertise, and ownership were critical for the effectiveness and sustainability of development work. The World Humanitarian Summit of 2016 was a key event, event bringing together donors, member states, and international and local organizations in Istanbul. A key outcome was the grand bargain a pact that underscored the importance of bolstering local capacities with key stakeholders pledging more support and funds to local and national responders. 
The underlying objective of this commitment was to increase the efficiency and effectiveness of humanitarian and development action. And there has been progress. And you have discussed many examples over the last two days. Across diverse cultural landscapes, from Asia to Europe to Latin America, initiatives are being implemented that respect local traditions and provide communities with the resources they need to steer their recovery and development. This approach acknowledges and strengthens people's fundamental rights and dignity. As examples, in the Asia-Pacific region, responses to natural disasters are increasingly, le increasingly led by local and national emergency medical teams. And community-managed disaster risk reduction initiatives have been successful in several countries, including in the Philippines and Ethiopia. Cash and voucher assistance programs, which are used in situations from armed conflict to natural disasters, allow affected individuals and families to determine their own aid needs. These programs encourage autonomy, protect dignity, and stimulate local economies. Cox's Bazar in Bangladesh and Ukraine offer successful examples in complex emergencies. Microfinance initiatives, such as the Grameen Bank in Bangladesh and various community, various community associations globally, engage member in man members in managing financial resources and making credit and savings decisions. These initiatives are based on trust and solidarity lending principles and focus on empowering local communities, especially women. There is also a growing body of evidence confirming the higher success rate of localized strategies in fostering resilience to natural disasters and improve health outcomes in women-led projects across different continents. In Australia, of course, there are also important examples. Indigenous communities are increasingly at the forefront of initiatives concerning their land, their health, and their cultural heritage, blending traditional knowledge with contemporary management practices. Also, community participation has been pivotal in the recovery process from the devastating 2019-2020 bushfires. These examples signal a shift in the humanitarian and development sectors towards more inclusive, participatory, and context-specific approaches. However, there is still a considerable way to go. Moreover, in a world facing simultaneously multiple wars, the looming threat of another pandemic, an stagnating global economy, and the profound effects of climate change, there is also a sense of urgency and the need to act fast. Both scale and speed are needed. If we examine the COVID-19 pandemic, it highlighted our systemic vulnerabilities. Several supply chains came to a, came to a halt due to a lack of manufacturing diversity. Humanitarian efforts reliant on international teams suffered and data systems needed for epidemiological surveillance were simply not in place in many areas of the world. At human level, we collectively felt the impact of loneliness and the unraveling of vital connections within our social fabric. The pandemic also brought us to start recognizing that we were walking and we have started to walk towards a mental health pandemic for which we are largely unprepared. The answer for some of these complex challenges rests on true localization, on the very notion that local communities are the ones best placed to respond. And in truth, local structures and individuals, even when unprepared, are invariably the first ones to respond. Community members act because it is their son or daughter who is buried under the rubble after an earthquake. It is their father or brother who is wounded in a bomb attack and needs to be taken to a hospital, or the friend's house that is at risk of being swept away by a flood. They respond because acting, doing, 
is the genetic imperative we have as a species because individuals and communities do act and respond when faced with adversity. As we strive to accelerate progress, we are confronted with a question, particularly after listening to so many positive examples. Given that there are already these examples of localized action, can we simply scale them up to generate a broader impact? Yet, this question reveals a paradox. On one hand, effective localization requires a deep understanding of and the adaptation to local needs and the lived-in experiences of communities. On the other hand, the uniqueness of these tailored strategies makes them challenging to replicate, even within the same region or within the same country. The main challenges we encounter when trying to scale up community-based initiatives or community-led initiatives by replication include, to name only three, cultural and contextual differences, such as power and gender dynamics, local norms and practices, demographics, specific population needs. Second, resource constraints. Many areas grapple with the scarce financial resources, a skill labor, a labor and infrastructure, which can hinder the replication of models that might have been successful in a more developed context. Third, weak governance or insufficient institutional support. Certain regions might experience a deficit in political will or institutional capacity to effectively carry out community-based or community-led strategies. These challenges, however, when replicating or trying to replicate models, should not be viewed as insurmountable. Rather, they should be recognized as areas needing increased funding, policy attention, and engagement. In some cases, additional knowledge or data may be required. But besides these challenges, there are other several overarching of global issues that demand urgent attention. Among these, some of these topics were discussed at the Grand Bargain Annual Meeting this year. Today, despite significant efforts from numerous stakeholders, the reality is that funding mechanisms are still not fit for purpose. Anticipatory action and prevention remains underfunded, and the participation of affected people is still too limited. So allow me to examine these points more closely. Funding mechanisms are not currently adequate due to both quality and quantity issues. High quality funding, funding that is flexible, predictable, and aligned with the needs of populations at the local level is insufficient. There is also a shortfall in funding that goes directly to local actors. Funds from development banks are typically disbursed to national governments, which then allocate them through government agencies or large NGOs. National agencies, aid agencies from various donor countries, allocate a portion of their budgets to support community-led projects, typically channeling these funds via NGOs, international organizations, or contractors. Foundations and philanthropic entities also contribute to community initiatives, but their support is usually targeted at the specific themes or sectors, which might sometimes not coincide with the most urgent needs of the community. A smaller local groups, such as grassroots NGOs, grassroots NGOs or community associations, rarely receive direct funding due to the stringent financial management requirements that they, are, that they find difficult to fulfill. In essence, the systemic structures for funding in the humanitarian and development sectors are often inflexible and complex, posing challenges for local initiatives to access and effectively utilize funds to address the immediate and specific needs of their communities. This inflexibility can delay the delivery of aid and reduce its effectiveness, leaving individuals and communities disempowered and lacking the support they need to manage and recover from crisis. 
I also mentioned that anticipatory action and prevention are underfunded. And the lack of investment in these areas undermines the capacity for proactive crisis mitigation. We need to recognize here that a key obstacle is the challenge of quantifying the impact of crises that have been averted. That is measuring outcomes that have not occurred or might never occur. Without concrete metrics to demonstrate the value of prevention, garnering support and funding for such initiatives is challenging. Consequently, communities remain vulnerable, often enduring preventable repercussions that could have been lessened with early interventions and a commitment to preparedness. Finally, there is limited participation of affected people. And please remember that I am talking about crisis context here, therefore the affected people I emphasize. Despite various efforts and pledges, the prevailing model of humanitarian aid still frequently fails to incorporate the perspectives and inputs of the very people it intends to help. When affected individuals are not actively engaged in designing the aid they receive, the risk increases that the support provided won't fully meet their needs or may miss crucial cultural and contextual specifics. This exclusion can foster as well a sense of disempowerment and can impair the efficacy of the aid delivered. As not everything is challenging, and as I approach my final points, let's consider some of the opportunities that we have ahead of us to tackle these global challenges. First, we must persist in our commitment to promoting and enhancing localization. And as you have been discussing the last two days, community-led interventions. No one said it was going to be easy, but our efforts must be unwavering. This involves truly engaging with local actors. And by local actors, I mean individuals, families, and local organizations, both in terms of decision-making and resource allocation. Second, we must strengthen the participation of affected or impacted communities. This involves not only listening to their needs and feedback, but also actively integrating them into the planning and implementation phases of humanitarian action. Beyond integration, it is critical to progress towards initiatives that are led by the communities themselves. Third, the provision of quality funding at a scale is necessary. Such funding should be not just sufficient in amount, but also adaptable and attuned to the evolving requirements on the ground. Fourth, rapid sector-wide transformations are needed. Changes that ensure coordination and complementarity between humanitarian and development objectives and funding and that consistently use systems and tools to reduce the risk of leaving those most at risk behind, older persons, women, children, persons with disabilities. I am a humanitarian worker, so I cannot conclude without addressing the unique challenges of localization efforts in areas afflict afflicted by armed conflict, where errors can have dire consequences. In such zones, community-led initiatives are particularly valuable as they often meet local needs more effectively and can contribute to building resilience. In some cases, they foster an environment conducive to peace building. However, the approach in these areas must be sensitive to the complex dynamics of armed conflict. Key, key considerations include a strict adherence to the do not harm principle, ensuring that actions do not exacerbate tensions or conflict and prioritizing the safety and security of both community members and implementers. Building trust. Initiatives must be rooted in deep engagement with the community, understanding their perspectives, their fears, their hopes, this requires building relationships over time, often months and years. Ensuring inclusivity and representation. 
This is not easy in these settings as they are often highly fragmented. However, it is crucial to ensure that marginalized and conflict affected groups are represented and have a voice in these initiatives. Incorporating flexibility. Armed conflict zones by definition can experience changes very rapidly. Programs should therefore be designed with adaptability in mind, including in their monitoring and evaluation mechanisms. And finally, if the situation on the ground is too polarized or volatile, or if the local capacities are stretched thin, temporary, temporary external expertise and support might be necessary. As coined by the Secretary General at the World Humanitarian Summit, as local as possible, as international as needed. Yet, even in these circumstances, cultural sensitivity and respect for the dignity and agency of individuals are of utmost importance. To conclude, localization in humanitarian aid and development is more than a mere, mere strategy. It is a profound commitment to upholding the dignity of every person we aim to support. As enshrined in the United Nations Universal Declaration of Human Rights, every person has the right to respect, agency, and the ability to shape their destiny. The path ahead is to facilitate, not to dictate, and to nurture local resilience and capacity. True localization means placing local voices in charge, valuing and leveraging their wisdom and traditions for sustainable, internally driven progress. It affirms human dignity, recognizing individuals not as recipients of aid, but as architects of their progress. This respect for autonomy addresses the deep-seated human need to act and to be acknowledged and respected. To truly understand localization, we must immerse ourselves in the communities we serve. This requires a shift from being providers of aid to becoming partners in development. We must work closely with local leaders, civil society, and the people themselves, building trust and understanding. This shift is not only ethical, but practical. When local communities are involved in decision making, the solutions they develop are more likely to, likely to be effective, embraced, and sustained. Finally, localization doesn't adhere to a universal blueprint. It is a tailor-made process that must be adapted to different cultural landscapes in which we work. At times, when the task seems daunting, Remember to focus on the individuals, the families, and the communities you aim to serve. And if policy making or your different work distances you from these communities, let the memories of compromised dignity that you have in your brain guide you to firstly safeguard it in your decisions. Let's work towards a humanitarian and development system where localization is the norm not just an alternative. A pillar anchoring our shared humanity, which upholds dignity at every juncture and recognizes our innate impulse to act in the face of adversity. For me, the lesson taught by those Kosovar bakers will continue to guide my actions. I am committed to ensuring that regardless of the challenges, there will always be a space for chapatis, pitas, or local breads to be baked by the hands that know them the best. Thank you. I think you'll agree with me that that was an extraordinary address. We have about 20 minutes for questions and answer. There are some mo roving microphones. There are some, also some people online and outside this lecture theatre from whom we'll, we'll take questions. So please open your hearts and, and your minds for Esperanza.
behind you. So can you please in, say your name and, and where you're from? Hi, my name's Matt Spanigal. I work for a company called Palladium. Thank you very much for your oration. I thought it was terrific. Um, in some localization contexts, some of the issues we seek to address may not be welcomed in the local context, and I mean in particular the LGBTQIA plus community. I wonder if you have any insights that you could share on how you reach those most vulnerable groups. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for that um, comment. Um, it is not easy, and one of the questions or the comments I made is really how do you truly understand the community? Building trust is extremely important. You cannot go, or you, we cannot work in communities that we basically have no understanding of, that we basically have no connections. And what I'm trying to say today is we have for the last two days really spoken about localization from a systems perspective, funding perspective, and a process perspective. At the end of the day, localization is about us humans and recognizing that we have this need to be, to be identified, to be respected, and to be heard. Now, that doesn't mean that certain contexts don't have populations that are very high risk that are invisible. We just don't see them. And as you said, even trying to work with those communities might generate more reactions and can even endanger them by trying to bring them into the light. So that's where an understanding of the context and working with local actors is extremely critical. Now, we in the humanitarian sector very often say there are no humanitarian solutions to humanitarian problems. There are political solutions. So therefore, when we talk about this human-to-human -human connection, there is also the upper layer that needs to be worked on, the political layer, country to country, government to government. What discussions need to be happening at that level so the local construction of projects actually can take place in safety? So this is both, both layers. But the deep trust and understanding of the community is going to be super critical. Thank you so much for that very inspiring speech. I'm Nihal Said from IPPF. Um, I wanted to ask you, how do we as humanitarian actors use the power and contact with affected communities to advocate for increased human dignity? Because not necessarily human, humanitarian workers view themselves as advocates for alleviating the suffering. So how can uh, humanitarian workers use that power and that connection with affected communities to advocate for elevating suffering. I don't think this happens only in the humanitarian sector. It happens also in the development sector. So it's the recognition that we are not actors of their development. Communities live in their own space. Communities own the land. Communities were there before we arrived with our aid program, with our development program. They have been surviving or they have been thriving in those areas. Depends on how we look. We often arrive in those contexts and we say, oh my God, these people are really having a hard time. Actually, their families, the communities, they have their own rhythm of development. And for them, for their culture, that's appropriate. So that's where I think this, this, we need to be very humble in the way we work with communities. We are there to support the development. We are there to, how can we help you to continue to advance in your pathway? But I am not naive, and of course, when we talk about the development and the aid agenda, it's very mu much linked to nation building, particularly development. Development has nation building purposes. But then, again, I go back to the different layers. We cannot do community engagement effectively if the other ledgers are not taking place at the same time. The respect for human rights, the respect for minorities, all of those elements have to be discussed also at, at the various layers. Because as actors on the ground, you are either going, particularly it's a very sensitive humanitarian context, you are going to be either driven away, injured, or you are going to put someone in danger if you don't have the support of the other ledgers. So all of this needs to happen simultaneously. 
But what I want to, what I wanted to say today is that I have been listening to, listening to some of the, of the changes, and many of your questions have been so, so eliminating. Because is this dichotomy, do we do A or B? Is it up here or down here? It's both, and it's everything at the same time. The politician, the prime minister discussing with the prime minister, they do have an agenda, and that agenda needs to be discussed at every other level. But if it's rooted in the knowledge that people need to have their agency respected, it is going to be easier because we have found a common denominator across all the different layers. And that we often see missing in these conversations. We talk about the upper layers and we forgot about that one that anchors us, humanity, our connection as human beings. Was there a question or a statement? Yeah, we've got a question on the left. Fantastic. We've got a microphone. Hello. My name is Martina Zaff. I'm from the Development Intelligence Lab. Um, thank you for the very inspiring remarks. Um, I was also at the World Humanitarian Summit in Istanbul in 2016 um, and witnessed the debates and that consensus that emerged there around the issues that you described. And yet, I think here we are more than seven and a half years later, and while some progress has been made, uh, I think we still have a long way to go. So I'm wondering if you have some thoughts on what is limiting that progress. Uh, why haven't we advanced those issues further that we've been talking about for so long now? And what would be some key actions that could be taken in order to unblock and catalyze those changes? Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I think we have, uh, we have come to a point in human history. And we say that every generation thinks that it's the end of the world. So it is, it is not new. We, we look at what's happening and we are scared. And we, we say, well, this is, this is really, really complex. I think what is happening today in the world is that we have a combination that is happening at a really, really fast speed. If we look at, and yesterday we hear some of you that were in the dinner, we're talking about AI. We listen about AI and how fast this is really moving forward. And if you, if you add to that, the deterioration of living conditions for humans, for plants, and for animals because of climate change is fast. I mean, we, we humans don't grapple the consequences of the notion of exponential change. And we're going to a point where we have different factors that are throwing us into a compounded situation, what is called a polycrisis, where one crisis or one, one issue doesn't act on its own, but actually really nurtures another crisis of equal or bigger man magnitude. At the end of the day, we have also poverty. I mean, COVID-19 was a really, really difficult uh, a crisis, not only from a public health perspective, from an economic perspective. Millions and millions of people lost their informal economies, the way they were barely surviving. So I think what we have, and in response to your question, is we are at the point where we have a convergence of crises that really must propel us to act, to swiftly try to find solutions. There is one sentence in the innovation that says, you really try to innovate fast and fail fast. Really, try to, to, to do different things to see if you can advance some of those indicators and advance on some of the things that the communities need with the communities. Because the community is going to tell you what they need and what they don't need. So I think this element of crisis is an element that we can really build on and say, okay, let's gather together and let's work together and let's move forward. And there is one point that I want to bring that it just came really, really very, very evident the la these two days. And it's the fact that many of you are working on similar things. And when you have, we are saying the system is failing, there are systemic problems, it's not working. In theory of systems change, when a system is dying or needing change, a new one doesn't emerge organically. A new, one, a new one has to be formed. And the way a new system is formed is by the, co by the coalescence of different initiatives. Very different efforts get together and then peer-to-peer -peer interaction, community to community, organization to organization, and start to really transform within your own, within your own domain. Because if that transformation takes place, then change could happen upwards and downwards. 
So that's also, I think, is the element of a speed that might be what will propel us forward today rather than in the last few years. I forgot to say, Russ, when I was invited to deliver this uh, oration, which is a complete privilege, and really thank you very much for inviting me, I fail to say that I am a realistic optimist. I always see crisis as an opportunity to propel forward. Crises are amazing at giving us the opportunity to, to really, really argue for change. When things are stable and they don't work really well, but it's difficult to get out of it. In crisis, you do have, we all have a unique opportunity. So let's try to see if coming out of here and in your own sectors, you get together and you propel change with the communities that you serve. Just building on that a bit, Esperanza, you and I are both medical practitioners with a, a, an interest and in work in emergency medicine. And I think you probably have a similar experience to me that the emergency medicine community is somehow separate from the, the chronic disease management community and there's often a gulf between. But by parallel, as a spending a long time in the humanitarian sector and now speaking to the development community more broadly, what's your experience of how the humanitarian sector is perceived by the development community and what what opportunities do you see for there to be to build bridges? And many of you work with different funding agencies of donors and you are very familiar that it doesn't happen here in Australia of the region, but in many different countries you do have a complete separation of the aid and the development funding. So completely separate. And very often they see the ministries that don't talk to each other. So the, the agendas are different. So it's the separation between, I, I cannot say which one here is emergency, but you could say chronic uh, development and aid uh, emergency. So you do have that separation. However, if you do have a patient with diabetes in your ER, your emergency room, and it comes with a trauma, if you ignore the diabetes, you might actually kill the patient. So you do need to, to do both. And I think like in medicine, that's one of the things that we often, uh, box ourselves. We are humanitarians or we are development practitioners. Communities really don't care. Communities only look, do they have water? Do they have a health center to go to? Do they have food tomorrow for the children? That's at the end of the day, whether that is labeled aid or development, it really doesn't matter. What I find though, that there is a, a, a challenging situation is in public health interventions. And COVID was one of those situations in which in many countries in Africa, we were, when the vaccines were started to be rolled out, it was going to try to talk to communities about vaccination, communities that didn't have even running water, that didn't have food on the table, that haven't seen a development initiative for years, they couldn't possibly even roll out and arrive and say, hey, here is the COVID-19 vaccine. I said, well, we don't have COVID, we have, oh, we might, but we are dying of malaria, of diarrhea, of malnutrition. What are you doing about that? And then you cannot resolve those problems when you have a crisis. Those issues have to be addressed way ahead of the crisis. So we really, when I say we need systemic changes, is we need really to have this conversation between aid and development that actually pursues the same, the, the same goals. Also, you don't do a firefighting plan in the middle of a fire. So the whole prevention and, and funding for preventive uh, action and, and anticipatory action is critical. And the challenge, and I think there is a call for, for, acad for the academic sector and for researchers, is how do we measure those things that we prevent? We have the same problem in medicine. And I think it's an area where actually work between policymakers and researchers could really, really move forward. That is space of, uh, it's just so difficult to argue because yeah, well, nothing happened. So we are, we are experiencing that with COVID. The fact that, okay, just, yeah, we are all getting COVID today, but we are not dying. So why do we need to continue to work on pandemic preparedness? And if we talk to scientists, we are only one mutation away from another catastrophe. But in that sense, we humans have this tendency of, of not looking at the long term, 
and I think it's a space where really research can bring a lot of the, of the answers that are needed. Another one in the other room or online. Um, hi there, my name's Emily Dwyer from Edge Effect. Um, I was just reflecting upon some of the sort of the structural reasons why you, why localization isn't happening. Um, just if, for example, the way that, that funding flows happen uh, and the, 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 the apparent impossibility of changing the kinds of requirements um, that would that would allow smaller organizations to, to get access to funding. And, and I was wondering whether you might re reflect on Perhaps the reality is that donors, UN agencies, and international NGOs simply don't want localization. Um, that we talk about it, um, but organizations that have power, in truth, actually just don't want to give up that power. Um, and I was wondering whether you see a possible pathway toward localization that doesn't involve organizations that have power voluntarily giving that power up. It is very interesting because the, thank you very much for the, for the question and the comment. It's very interesting because the issue of power has come repetitively uh, in, different, in different panels in this conversation. Um, and at the end of the day, it is, it is uh, funding and leverage and incentives. And it is a pervasive situation we have both in the humanitarian and the development sector. Um, it's a speed we need to do fast. And if you want to build trust, you just don't hold trust in communities, you develop trust. But there are always, always ways to find uh, who are the, the right interlocutors or the right persons to talk to in the community. Um, they might be women leaders, for example, even in societies that are very patriarchal or where men uh, dominate decision making, those men have mothers. And very often there is, there are women matriarchs who are actually, the, can manage the levers of power. So it's how do we engage with them actually to, to have these discussions in relation to how do they manage the dynamics of power at local level. Now we move upwards to, upwards to the level that you mentioned is within organizations that have incentives to continue to do what we do today. Um, again, I'm saying this as a realistic optimist. Uh, the fact that communities talk before, many years before, you didn't know what was happening to the community next to you. Today, a community is able to communicate to another community whether or not you are failing in what you are doing. So accountability by communities, it's going to be critical. And in this case, if communities are, it's not just that the government's policy is not changing or it's changing to force contractors or implementation agencies or NGOs to change, Communities more and more have the power to make agencies change. And I think we are going to see more moving forward. The risk there is the manipulation of that. In the space where we are today, misinformation and disinformation and the manipulation of messaging can be really, really damaging. And there we go back to the element of trust. If you are a trusted partner, if you are known, if you really know the community, and your community, your local team members are not there for you to tick a box, but are there because they truly represent their communities, you are one step ahead of that wave of misinformation and disinformation that may come um, along the way. So again, it's trailblazing. It's, it's, it's moving along with these different initiatives that might make a difference. Time for one question, one more there. so much for a really stimulating and challenging uh, oration and I think a very important one to end our conference on. I wanted to go back to something that you said in the beginning of your talk about signalling a, a shift for participatory and inclusive approaches and then talking about the fact that we're actually walking towards a mental health pandemic to which we are not ready. And I wondered if you could comment further on how you see that engaging in the localization discussion that we've had today and also what the implications are for development and aid. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. And um, I think one of the, it's, it's a positive shift that the pandemic brought and it's the fact that it's not no shame on talking about mental health issues any longer. Again, in every crisis there is a silver lining. Um, but if we look at the statistics, actually they are very worrying. The statistics that I, I, I was um, uh, presented with or I, I heard uh, a few weeks back here with an ANU, young people today, young girls, have nearly 50% of chance of suffering mental health disorder in the coming years. None of us in the community or in our health systems is prepared for that. So this is to say as well that localization is a way of doing things. Localization doesn't determine what we do. We need to continue to work on the rights of minorities. We need to continue to work on the key pressing issues for communities. We need to, com com to make sure that gender imbalances and, and gender equity is at the top of the agenda. Localization is how we do it. We don't do it for the community. We do it with the community. We are, and it's really a humbling exercise when you put yourself in a situation where you don't dictate where you listen and you truly say, okay, how can I help? How can I support your pathway? And I come back to the conversation of power. It is extremely uncomfortable to do that. It is it's a high degree of vulnerability. At the same time, when those uh, projects take off and another community might come along and say, huh, what are you doing? The possibility to not replicate but adapt that knowledge could really flourish. So mental health is one of those elements where, where I'm not talking about pathologies that require treatment, but psychosocial conditions are very often linked to social factors, to the disintegration of family links, to the disintegration of, of networks and so on and so forth. Who reconstruct those? Families, communities, friends. So it's all of those elements. We really need to go down to the how and use this truly led uh, localization initiatives to, to work on those. Um. I think you'll agree with me that that's a wonderful end to what was a wonderful Mitchell oration. Please give a round of applause. To you. Thank you for being a wonderful audience. Um, we're just going to rearrange the stage. Uh, so you can stand up and have a wiggle. And um, no, don't, leave. We'll be, don't leave, don't move. Just stand up in your seats and have a wiggle. And then uh, we'll be back.
Hello, everybody. <laughs> Do we want to shout out for people in the corridor, or shall we just charge ahead? OK. All right. All right, good afternoon. Good afternoon and welcome to our final plenary. My name is Anthea Mulakala, I'm with the Asia Foundation. And uh, first, I acknowledge the Nunawal and Nambri people who are the traditional custodians of the Canberra area and pay respect to the elders past and present of all Australia's indigenous peoples. And second, I must apologize that I am not Carly Shalito. Uh, if you were looking forward to seeing her today, unfortunately she couldn't join us, so I am the stand-in. However, uh, regardless of the moderator for today, this panel proposes, uh, promises to be gripping. The one issue that has consistently been a high priority and demand issue for the Australasian Aid Conference over the years is Pacific labor migration. And the Development Policy Center and the World Bank have been working on Pacific migration for over a decade, since the early days of the seasonal worker program, which was relatively small at the start. And today, when the schemes are no longer small, there is increased focus on the Pacific, introduction of the Pacific labor scheme with long stay visas, no longer only seasonal ones, and more recently, the Pacific Engagement Visa Lottery. Now, Pacific migration is one of, if not the central development aid initiative for Australia in the region. And we heard yesterday from Professor Biman Prashad, who couldn't have been clearer in his call for a visa-free region. So the report we'll be discussing today summarizes the findings of a multi-year project initiated before the pandemic in 2019. Specifically, it's a large-scale survey project spanning five countries and the first large-scale data collection exercise since the introduction of the Pacific Labour Scheme in Australia and an increase in concerns around worker welfare and social impacts in the region. So the research team includes Dr. Zhong Duan, who is a social protection economist with the World Bank, Dr. Matt Dornan, who is a senior economist at the World Bank and formerly the deputy director of the Development Policy Center, and Dr. Ryan Edwards, who is deputy director currently of the Development Policy Center, and all three hold PhDs in economics from the Crawford School here at ANU. So Dung and Ryan will be presenting today, so I will welcome them to please, uh, are you gonna be speaking one at a time? Is that the plan? Sorry, very good. Dung, are you presenting first or Ryan? Ryan, all right. Uh, so please come up, Ryan. Welcome, and we look forward to seeing the results of the survey. Thank you very much, Anthea, for the generous introduction and for your continued support for our, for our centre and for the work that we do at this conference. It's an honour to be closing, especially oh, near the mic, okay. It's an honour to be effectively closing this one off this. Today has been really great two days. I hope that everyone has enjoyed it and found the discussion fascinating and stimulating. So as, as mentioned, we're going to be sharing um, some findings from a new project. Although there's the three of us listed here on the front and mentioned, it would be misleading to not say that there's, there have been countless people across the region and indeed across the world who have contributed to making it possible since Matt first sort of conjured it up around 2019 actually, before I even came back to this continent. Um, so what we're going to talk about today is effectively two things. The first one is a large survey as mentioned. It's omnibus in nature, it covers a lot. Um, and it's of households and of migrant workers themselves, covering five countries, three sending and two receiving. Kiribati, Vanuatu and Tonga are the three sending countries that we focus on. And we're gonna focus on temporary migrants, not permanent, even though permanency is becoming an increasing focus of these policy discussions. The households back home, but also non-sending households. And the focus is very much what we're gonna talk about today on workers and their welfare. And sort of bringing, to, bringing out what we've got in the survey, in the data, is a report that we just put out. It's titled, The Gains and the Pains of Working Away from Home. And that report does a few things. It's principally descriptive. The goal of it is to basically to put the data without judgment out there so everyone can kind of just interpret what all the facts say. 
um, from this exercise. So in today's talk, we're going to introduce the, screams, the, streams, the, the schemes and the survey project briefly. We're going to share some descriptive survey responses received, focusing very much on the average across these questions and the data we got back by scheme and by country. We're not going to delve too much into specific cases or specific distributional impacts in small groups or anything like that. I'm going to talk a little bit about some preliminary impact estimates and then offer some conservative recommendations that are very much backed up by the data we collected. So there's a few contributions that this project does bring. Um, the first one is that this is kind of the, large, the first large scale quantitative data collection exercise that's happened since the introduction of the PLS in 2019, which is also really since the pandemic and it's also really since the rapid growth in these schemes have happened. And of course the explosion in concerns about worker welfare and social impacts in sending countries. It's also the first comparative data on the different schemes. So now, oh, now the SWP and the PLS are the one, the one palm scheme, but they're functionally two different ones with short stays and long, and long stays, at least when we collected the data, and also the RSC in New Zealand. So you, we can do some comparative exercises here. And because it's omnibus in nature, meaning it covers a whole bunch of economic, social, subjective, other types of indicators, it's hopefully going to be of much wider use for the research and also the sort of policy and analytical community once we, once we put it out there. We've, we have collected a control group, which allows us to speak to some extent to impacts by being able to compare to non-sending households as well. And we've got a lot of information in there about how pe people select in, how they know about the schemes to try and sort of remove biases when you might do such comparisons. And lastly, this is probably the most exciting part. It's the first wave of this project. It's designed to be a long-term thing where we can track migrants over time and build, build a panel where you can answer all types of life cycle questions that you can't answer with these sort of one-shot, smaller scale surveys that have been done in the past. And la lastly, it's going to be open access. So we'll be posting everything hopefully really soon, all de-anonymised, public so people can go over and write their own papers, dig deeper, um, and do lots more stuff with the, with the, with the project. So first I'm going to do what we often do in economic seminars, even though this is very much not one, um, and preview a few of the key findings. And there's four of them, four main takeaways that would be good if everyone can potentially leave with. The first thing that we do find of the survey, so we survey about 2,000 workers, and we find that on average, in general, across all of them, people seem to be very satisfied. On a scale of 1 to 10, um, they're reporting at the top. And this is both overall, their experience in the job and in the host country, and across many specific dimensions. And interestingly, we use the same questions for here as we used in earlier surveys. So regardless of how much you might like subjective questions like that, we can compare them over time because the method is very constant. And we don't really find any deterioration since COVID or since the rapid growth in the schemes. And then we also ask about a whole range of social outcomes and social issues. And overwhelmingly, the responses to them are pretty positive, both from the workers, from the households themselves, and from the communities where people, these people are participating in the schemes from and they come from that are not, go not going themselves and not benefiting directly through their household members participating. For example, we do find that people report their family relationships often getting stronger rather than weaker, as we would often hear from some of the case study research that's been done in parallel. Uh, and we do find that women report improvements along various dimensions of empowerment. On the economic benefits, well, we don't really have much news in that regard because we've studied that a lot in the past and a lot of that is kind of like an obvious fact so far. But we have got some updated estimates on how big the earnings gains are when people move from their pre-departure earnings to working over here and in New Zealand. So for Tonga, for example, it's around three to, three to four fold, fold increases in what you would earn back home. But for Vanuatu, which has a much lower GDP per capita than Tonga, these gains are up to tenfold. So a huge order of magnitude of gains. And when we break down what people's basically consumption and expenditure baskets look like in the host countries, we find that up to 60% of that is left over after all your deductions and your cost of living abroad. So a lot is still left to be saved or to be sent back home to remittances still, despite the cost of living crisis and housing the way it is in this country. And if we do some impact estimates, we find that expenditure savings and community spending are about 20% higher in the sending households than they are in similar households. But not, not all is rosy, of course. There's a lot of things people were not at all afraid to voice their discontent and their concerns with us. Um, the main, one of the main issues people were concerned about was the dedu deductions remaining high, um, so sometimes not understanding the deductions. But then there's also really strong intre in, interest in, as was previously discussed, agency, people being able to potentially change employers and vote with their feet and having more flexibility in their day-to-day -day activities. There's also many instances and specific cases of concerns. 
Um, and we did do qualitative work on the site, which I'll talk about in a moment as well. And this, of course, relates to issues like family separation around the long stay visas and things like that, which we've been talking about for a long time on our blog. And um, as many people know, this is some of the only visas where people can't bring their families along with them. So outline for today's presentation is actually quite, quite straightforward. I'm going to talk a bit about the survey. Um, then I'm going to talk a little bit about the economic impacts before handing over to my fantastic colleague Zong for the more interesting stuff on the work, work, worker welfare, social impacts and policy. So, what were the main objectives? So this was motivated largely by uh, the da data and, and da the data ecosystem. It's quite hard to access data in the region. There's not that much readily available. A lot of it often sits in NSOs or is kind of done in a patch patchwork way or it might sit with a big contract or be related to a specific project. So one thing we're trying to do here is sort of, at least for those of us that are really interested in labor mobility and migration, address this fragmentation, availability and coverage and comparability and try and bring forward a public good that can be kind of used by anyone to try and assess some basic facts. For example, the non, the non labor sending households that it basically emulates a labor, labor force survey in a country. So if you wanted to go and assess employment or female labor force participation, you can go and do this with the data set without having to go and get a labor force survey from the National Stats Office or from wherever else. Importantly, it does provide a systematic update to our knowledge of the workers and their families. Most of what we hear will be mediated through journalists or through problems that have been raised with high, the high commissioners or through unions or things like that. Whereas we've come in this kind of with a clean slate, no prize. We wanted to kind of just, just collect the data and then see what comes back to us. And because we've got the control, the control group and we do ask a lot of questions about people's perceptions and opinions, we can look at impacts and we can do it now. We could do it comparatively across schemes and in future ways we can also look at how these change over time. So as I mentioned, it's the first sort of independent large scale survey across these schemes on a whole range of socioeconomic indicators. Don't let me use my hands on welfare, <laughs> on any households. Um, but I guess real, quite importantly, a lot of this sort of research that has been done so far and is still sort of done on labor mobility um, it's often done in a qualitative nature, done with workers, done with their households, done in a small scale nature. So we made sure that we did a big parallel study at the same time, focused on gender and social impacts. I can see some of the main contributors in the audience here. Um, so, so big, big thank you to them as well. But this covered more than 450 in-depth qualitative interviews. Each of them were much longer than our one to two hour surveys. Um, and these, for the most part, tell a lot of the same stories and also bring out the nuances. So having this qualitative work and this quantitative work kind of go at the same issues and then reinforce the messages from one another, serve as important validation exercises on, on each other to help us sort of come, to come together with a big picture understanding of what's going on. And as mentioned, this is part of a long-standing collaboration that we hope will continue for much longer. Um, so what does it look like in, in practice? So we've got the three countries that we're sending. The PLMS is the quantitative component, and then the qualitative work forms a gender report, which you can also find on the World Bank's website. The World Bank led that. Um, it's fantastic. They it cover, as we can see, 419 workers, households, and community members, and 42 other key informants in the communities and recruitment process. The PLMS itself, however, about over 2,000 workers, over 2,000 sending households, many of which are the workers' households themselves. We were able to link a lot of them, but not all. Um, and when doing the household survey, importantly, it was a roster. So multiply that number out by what the family size is in the region, and that's how many individual records that we have in the individual data. So it's very rich for analysis. Um, and we've got a similar number of non-sending households. So the data collection itself. Um, it was, of course, completely voluntary, strictly confidential with the tightest protocols in place. Um, it was aimed to be objective, but I'll talk about a little bit of that in a moment. Um, and of course, it was language appropriate. Everything was translated into local language and all the questions were done by local enumerators um, with local field teams. In the case of the Tongan face-to-face -face component, that was done by the same very team at, at the stats office and survey firm that did the census around the same time. Um, and so we had lots of quality controls in place, both in terms of supervision and elsewhere. But importantly, there was a bit of distance between our design, doing up the questions and what we wanted to see come answered, and the data coming back to us to then analyse as the PR. So we didn't have much scope for interpreting or things like that. We had, we had to supervise as it was coming on, but it was only when it came back that we could start the analysis and report what we found. So, so similarly, so there's a bit of this distance there, which gives it a little, hopefully a little bit more objectivity. Um, and when, you, when we're talking about what we've seen in the report, this has undergone multiple rounds of not journal peer review, but internal colleagues, external colleagues, and the, the World, Bank, World Bank peer review as well. 
So the work of phone survey was done from December 2022 to March 2023. It was about, about, an, about an hour long. Um, and it was done by the phone because, largely because of COVID. We had to move from face to face to online for largely health and security reasons. Um, but the whole project started face to face. Um, so the Tonga questionnaire is a little bit longer. This was done around the volcanic eruption, which you probably all remember, in November 21 to January 22. <coughs> And then we also collected a bit of supplementary data in Tonga as well, because some of the workers that we got to ended up not being in the original data set as well. Um, and they were done that way. Um, and so, yeah, they were about an hour to long for the phone surveys and two hours long for the face-to-face -face ones. And as I mentioned, it covers a lot of topics. Um, but yeah, onto some findings. So economic impacts. As I mentioned at the start in the preview, um, people do earn a lot more overseas than they would at home. Um, I've got average earnings up, up here for you, which is after tax and deductions, but that needs a grain of salt because the du deductions are not trivial. They're not small, and they do contribute quite a lot to what you're consuming. So your housing is covered there, your transport's covered. When you're thinking about welfare and sort of day-to-day -day consumption and living standards, you need to be including deductions in this realistically. But that's $800 a week after all of that, roughly. Above the minimum wage here. Um, so, and earnings gains, so as I mentioned, about three to four times for Tongan workers, and nine to 10 times that for Vanuatu. And that exercise we do using all the individual data for those back home to try and figure out what, the, what, what exact wage the workers who are here would be earning if they were un, in the same conditions in their sending country labor market with the same characteristics they have. It's a bit tricky to explain, so I'm not going to um, any further. But once we do break down the expenditure, as I mentioned, you can see this in the middle graph here. You see the living expenses, then the deductions that come out. So about a quarter of your post-tax pay is going towards these deductions that the employers take out. Now, in all honesty, there often isn't the greatest understanding of the levels and why they're going out and how. Um, but then you can see the savings that are left over. So the savings are either getting carted back or sent back in, remi in remittances, which I'll talk about in a moment. So there's a lot left over. And interestingly, if we compare just this, so we focused on the season, not we, the, ba the bank focused on the seasonal workers in an earlier report. So we can compare this breakdown with what we've collected in that study. And interestingly, we do find that if you just look at the expenditures and the deductions as a share of the post-tax earnings, these have, these have fallen over time. So you've got a bit more left over, despite that the cost of living pressures here, which is a good new, overwhelmingly a good news story. So on to remittances briefly. So the, the average remittance, not, well not the average, the median remittance for someone who sends it regularly every week or fortnight is about $500 Australian per week or fortnight. So it's quite a lot. Um, and about... About, about 10, 20 percent of people are sending more on the ground, um, which is, seems seems wild. Um, and what are people using remittances for? So usually they finance basic consumption, so improvements in your basic expenditures, the food you're giving, but then also investment in human capital, particularly in terms of education costs and schools back home. Um, whenever we try and do some impact estimates of what your spending levels are like for households that participate versus those that don't, trying to correct for people's selection into the schemes, we find the gains around 20% as well. And interestingly, a lot of households are receiving remittances from non-household members as well. It's not just participating households that send remittances. If you look at the non-sending household survey as well, um, most households actually do send and receive remittances in the survey in Tonga, which shouldn't actually be surprising because Tonga is one of the high sending countries and has quite a culture of mobility with different areas. And one interesting point, this will be the last point that I'll make before handing over, is that remittances have actually become more frequent and more digital since the pandemic. Um, here you can sort of see the breakdown between online transfers, over-the-counter and mobile wallets, and a lot are going online. Um, but one interesting thing as well, if we compare senders and receivers to those who send and receive for whatever reason in the household survey, then those that are participating, those that are more involved in these schemes who might have younger migrants and elsewhere are actually a bit more likely to be digital, which is nice and shows that there's some degree of learning going on. Um, but this variability that you do see here in the graph, it's largely due to the different markets and the availability across countries and a whole bunch of other things. But yeah, that's enough from me. Um, <laughs> I hope it doesn't end here, should <laughs> And I said to them. <laughs> Thanks, Lauren, and um, good afternoon, everyone. Let me continue the presentation by presenting some results related to um, worker welfare um, and implementation aspect while they are in the host country. 
So this is a very dense slide, so stay with me. Uh, I hope you can see um, the detail at the back, but if not, please raise your hand. I'll try to walk you through um, all the details slowly. So overall, as Brian mentioned right at the beginning, um, a key finding that we see in this report is the vast majority of the workers are satisfied with their experience in the host country, both overall and across various dimensions when we ask them. Um, when we ask workers whether they want to return after their, their, working, their, their current work placement, whether they want to return to work for another time or, or a few more times, about 92% of them say yes, they do want to come back and, and work again. And if they say yes, we ask again how many times do they want to, to go back, and more than half of them say as many times as possible. So this is an indication of the demand from the workers themselves on, on these schemes. Um, and consistently over time, the, when we ask workers how satisfied they are with their overall experience in the host country, on a scale from 0 to 10, with 10 being extremely happy, extremely satisfied, and 0 being not satisfied at all, the score is about 8 on average, over time and across nationality, across scheme as well. So if you look at the table on the bottom left there, the first three um, columns in blue are the results by the PLS, SWP, and RSE that we have just collected through this survey. Um, the last three columns in black colors are from, our, from two other um, surveys that, that, that the World Bank did in the past. Um, the SWP and RSE 2022 were a result from our survey that we did at the early months of COVID-19. Um, and the last column was from the impact evaluation of the SWP program done back in 2015. So if you look at those numbers, we do not observe any systematic change or reductions of the satisfaction core uh, score over time or across countries. And when we ask workers a little bit more details on how do they feel, how satisfied they are, whether they are satisfied with their current employment in particular, only 7% of them said, no, they are not satisfied, which mean 93% of them say, yes, they are satisfied with their current employment. So this is a vast ma majority, and only the, the minority 7% say they are not satisfied. However, we should acknowledge that we should not ignore or dismiss these, the concern and the complaints on this 7%. When we ask workers about their, how do they feel about being treated in the host country and by, by the employers, again, the majority of the worker reported that they feel they are being fairly treated by, by the employers. Similarly, they also say they are fairly um, being fairly treated by, by in, in the host country. So on average, on average, across the scheme and across all the three sending countries, about 90% of the workers perceive that they are being fairly treated. Similarly, with accommodation, also about 90% of the workers are satisfied with their current accommodation in the host country. There is some variation, as you can see, on the two graphs there on the right-hand side, across scheme and across nationalities, but the overall message there is that the majority of them are, are happy with their, their treatment and, and the accommodation. However, as I mentioned earlier, we should not ignore the concern and complaint from the minority of workers who are not happy. And when we dig deeper to understand why they are not happy, what, what happened to them? So most of the complaint by the minority, the 7% who say they are not happy with the current employment, the complaints were related to salary deductions, um, the earning not meeting their expectation, as well as inconvenient working hours. Um, so just to put some context there, um, the deduction on average, the salary deduction make up about 25% of their after-tax earnings. And the average rent is about um, 360 Australian dollars per month. Um, disagreement between workers and their employers do exist and was reported by 8% of the workers. And interestingly, this percentage is highest among new Vanuatu workers in the SWP scheme. So 17% of Ni Vanuatu workers in the SWP, SWP scheme reported having disagreement or conflict with their employers, whereas in the other scheme and among Tongan and I Kiribati workers, the percentage is about 5-6% on average, or at most um, 8 or 7%. Um, there are other challenges that the workers bring out to us in terms of um, insufficient health insurance coverage and their desire for, to have more portabilities and more flexibility in managing their own affair while they're in the host country. Um, in terms of health insurance, um, we know that pregnancy is not covered by their private insurance um, at the moment. 
and dental problems is not covered either. And dental problem is the major, is the most common health problem that workers reported to us through our survey, about 80% of them, 80% of the reported health problems are related to, to their teeth. Um, however, when, and, and, and as you can see at the, uh, the bottom right graph there, about 40% of workers overall prefer to work for an alternative employers if given a chance. I want to make a point here. This is quite high compared to the small percentage of workers who reported um, having disagreement or conflict with their workers. So this design might not necessarily be relate, related to the fact that they dislike their employers or they have problem with their employers. It could be because they want to have agency, they want to have choices, or they are aware of different kind of job that they prefer somewhere else and that's why they want to have the, cho the, the, the options to move. Um, and the, the graph on the left hand side there show the percentage of those who, who are or who were paying deduction um, but perceive but consider that the deduction that they are being paying is excessive or unfair or intransparent. So on average, about half of those who are paying deductions decide their, their deduction there. And variation again across scheme and across nationalities, the percentage is highest again among Nivanuatu workers across all the scheme. And when we ask workers about the sort of social support that they, they have in the host country, four out of five told us that they are aware of who they could go to if they need help or if they need advice. Uh, and most of the time, workers would go to those who are most accessible to them, in particular their team leaders, their employers, and then their family members. There are a small percentage of workers who said they would go to churches or hotline or the liaison, country liaison offices, but that's the majority, that's the minority. Okay, that's a lot of numbers. So let me bring out a few words, a few quotes from the workers and the employers themselves um, to add more human touch to, to the graph and the, the huge amount of numbers that I just presented. Um, this is from the complementary in-depth qualitative study um, survey that that Brian mentioned from the beginning. And what we see is what the worker told us through, through the in-depth interviews are consistent with what we see through the quantitative data. So for example, a female Nivanuatu worker said, I don't like the deductions, and I need to know how much they are deducting from my payments and what for. There's another one, a male worker from Kiribati, who said, there were too many deductions from our pay, also, we were accommodated in a hotel and we did not have any option to eat, not to eat from the hotels. So this shows us that the dissatisfaction could come up, for, could be related to them not understanding why they are, why do they have to pay these deductions or because it is not what they expect before they, they, they arrive in the host country. Um, and the issues with accommodations that is often being reflected um, is not necessary because they are hosted in a, a poorly, poor amenity or bad accommodation. It could be because they are hosted in a hotel. Um, and then we have words from the employers as well, for example. An employer in Australia said, another thing that complicated the matter is that health insurance does not cover anyone who comes to the program pregnant. It means they have to take care of the cost of their health. They have to pay upfront for the, all the cost of the child. Where do we house them then? Is it fair for a worker to have a baby when they are living with four other ladies? We also heard from one employer who said one female worker faked their pregnancy test before they arrived in Australia. So apparently that worker sent someone else to do the, the, the test for, for her and when she arrived in Australia she was already pregnant and the employer had to sort that out. Um, a recognized uh, uh, RSE work employers in New Zealand said we need bigger place to take on women and men because they would have the capacity to provide separate facilities for women and men. Smaller, common, smaller companies just can't do this. And getting the accommodation approved by the Labor Department is very hard and it is highly regulated. So it's not easy to just add more, to recruit more workers, more female workers. Okay. So let me go a bit more into the social impact of these programs. Um, there is a common perception that these labor mobility programs bring economic gains in terms of income, in terms of remittances, but it comes with, they come with a social cost. <laughs> However, what we found in our data, as well as in the quality, in, in depth qualitative 
interviews is that in general, participating in labor mobility has a net social impact. It appears to strengthen family relationships and empower women. In particular, um, if you look at the first graph on the left-hand side there, the blue bar, the blue parts are the percentage of workers who say participating in the scheme has improved their relationship with their children. So about four in five survey workers reported improvement in relationship with their kids. And on this graph here, two in three survey workers reported improved marital relationships. Um, the orange bit are those who say participating has a negative um, impact on, on their relationships. Um, so again, the majority is a positive story, um, but we should not ignore the negative parts. So for relationship, for marital relationship, for example, about 25% of workers, both male and females, reported you know, a, 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 a negative impact, an adverse impact on, on their relationship with their spouse. Um, and this is consistent with, again, with the in-depth qualitative interview that we did around the same time, as well as it echo other qualitative case studies um, done in the literature. Um, and when we ask workers who reported improved marital relationship, why does that happen? Um, they point out to the impact of increased income and more goods being sent home, which helped to reduce the potential conflicts, especially where money stress was a source of conflict before. But they, there is more than that. They also say frequent communications and better understanding and respect of each other's roles also help, um, help improve the relationships. Uh, male workers experience in the, in, in the host country overseas appear to increase their, their understanding of the contribution of their wife and their spouse and increase their willingness to contribute to household chores when they return home as well. Um, and about 81% of the female workers that we interview experience greater agency. 87% um, reported having greater control over the financial resources in the households. Um, so again, let me try to bring out some quotes and some words from, from the workers and their family to add more nuances and colors to these numbers. Uh, the first quote was, is from a Tongan female seasonal workers. She said, for me and my husband, our relationship has just grown deeper. We have grown to appreciate each other more after the sacrifice we have shared. Um, and a, a family members of a seasonal workers in Vanuatu said, before mom did most of the cooking and washing, but after she participated, we are all sharing chores equally and tending to our own laundry, which is a great thing. I hope this is a kid. Um, and husband of a female seasonal workers in Tonga said, whenever I can't make any, de any decision on any issues, she sometimes decides for both of us, her mindset has been changed by participating in seasonal work. And a female, no, so it, it all seems nice, right? But the social norms and, and, and the gender-based roles do not just change completely. The culture is still there, the, 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 the limits is still there. Um, as this I Kiribati female worker said, though we can make our own decision, sometimes our culture is still there. Okay, now let's go to the family. How do the family perceive this game? Um, most of the household that we interview, both those who participate in the, the scheme and those who do not participate in the scheme, perceive labor mobility to be beneficial not only to themselves, for those who participate, but also to their own community. Um, so if you look at the first graph there on the left-hand side, the blue, the dark blue and, and light blue are the percentage of households um, who say that the scheme, who perceive the scheme as either very positive or positive to their communities. The orange and the yellow are the percentage of those who, say, who perceive the scheme as negative or very negative to their communities. So again, some variation ac across scheme and, and, and country, but the majority of them view the scheme positively. And when we ask those who say positive or, or very positive, what is the reason? What are the reasons for their positive perception? Then they point to higher income, better family relationships, improve local infrastructure in their communities, and improve children education outcome. And interestingly, if you look at the second graph here, 
the responses are very similar between the participating household and those who do not participate. So the blue, the blue bars are the sending household, the participating households, and the gray ones are the non-sending, the non-participating households. But again, let's not forget about those red and orange there who perceive the scheme negatively. Um, we did ask them why do they perceive the, the scheme negatively, and if you look at this graph, they point out several reasons. Um, increased violence toward women, increased use of alcohol, um, and then poorer relationship among household members, for example. We also have findings from the in-depth qualitative interviews which help to bring out more, more cases and, and um, explanation for this. Um, so localized labor shortage were reported in some communities, especially in rural Vanuatu. Um, there is pressure on, in terms of increased workload on the remaining family members when the workers were away for a long, peri long period of time. Um, there are also reports of marital breakdown, suspicion of extramarital affair, um, adverse impact on children such as neglect or behavioral problem. Um, and there are also, we also found adverse perception um, and moral judgment or, or gossip against the returned female workers. This is quite common in communities where there are only a few, num a few women who participate in this scheme. So when they return, they face this adverse reaction from their own community. Um, and they're also concerned about some male worker who spend a lot of their earning overseas on alcohol and end up with a little saving, saving when they return home. Um, Okay, again, some quotes to bring out more colors and nuances to this. So I have a quote from a community member um, who do not participate in this scheme from rural, rural Vanuatu who say that, I see fathers do not think seriously about saving. Mothers who have gone and have come back do many things compared to father. They came back, bought land, and think seriously about doing things for their children. So this is a very, very positive reaction and, and reflection. Um, on the impact of the scheme on the females who participate. Um, but then there is a family member of a male workers from Vanuatu who said, when he was away, there was a lot of work, especially with the kids' education. I was tired because he wasn't here. Sometimes I miss him very much, also with the church activities, but I do my best. So this reflects the pressure that the remaining family member felt um, due to the absence of the workers. Um, there's a key community informant in, in Vanuatu who said, who, who flagged the issues of labor shortage because a large number of workers has gone overseas. Um, and a key community informant in rural Tonga said, many of the families who live on seasonal work leave their children with their grandparents and lack proper discipline so that today already some children miss school and suffer neglect. Okay, so these are the quotes that bring out individual stories and, and more details that add up to, to our graphs and figures from the quantitative finding. Um, before I close, I want to raise a few caveats that we all want to acknowledge from, from our study. So as, men, as Ryan mentioned from the beginning, most of the finding that we reported in the report, which you would find outside, is very descriptive. Uh, we focus, in this report, we focus on sharing the data, sharing the statistics that we see in the data. We have not delved into more sophisticated econometric or statistical estimate just yet. Um, the survey does capture subjective opinions and assessment and perception of the workers of the household, as you see, and that's one of the purpose. We want to see how people subjectively perceive and feel about these programs and the impact of those programs. Um, but as with any subjective assessment, there are some potential bias there that we should be aware of. Um, the reported findings in, in, in our report, um, as you see in some of those graphs, usually we disaggregate them by scheme and by country. Um, but the, the, those graphs show the average, right? And, because, and those average mask the inter within group variation and specific cases. Um, but luckily we, do, we did the in-depth qualitative interviews which help us to, to confirm the, the overall stories and, and bring out some individual stories. Um, there are a few things we are not concerned with in this study. 
The first thing is the suitability of a large scale quantitative data set to examine, measure the extent of, and analyze different social aspects of the scheme. Um, we are not worried about the representativeness of the samples. I can explain more about the sample selection procedure and how we conduct the survey um, if there is time, but we do think this is the best available so far. Um, and our interpretation of the data that we presented has followed extensive consultation and pre-release sharing um, and rounds of peer review, so we are confident with that. So with that, let me bring out, let me propose a few recommendations for government to, from both sending and hosting country to consider. Um, our view is that there are a lot that can be done to improve um, and maximize the benefit and mitigate the adverse impact of this scheme. Um, given the overall positive pictures, we would recommend expanding opportunities, expanding labor mobility opportunities, especially to women and underrepresented countries. Um, in particular, we would recommend introducing a scheme in New Zealand equivalent to the PLS, and as I learned just two weeks ago in Vanuatu, um, this is happening already, so yay. At least one of our recommendations has been adopted. <laughs> um, we would recommend limiting or removing the specified work requirements for backpackers visa in Australia uh, and monitor demand from employers very carefully in both countries because at the end of the day, these schemes are demand dri driven. Um, if, the dem if the demand is there, the scheme will stay. Um, we also recommend diversifying participa participation among labor sending countries. So as um, if you are familiar with the context, Tonga, Vanuatu, and Samoa has been dominating the scheme in terms of the number of the workers, whereas other countries have much smaller number of workers. So diversifying it would bring the opportunities to a larger, a broader um, group of peoples in the region. Um, we would also encourage labor sending countries to look beyond Australia and New Zealand for labor mobility opportunities. Um, and given all the, con all the fighting related to worker welfare and concern and complaints from the workers that we receive in our data set, we want to recommend um, measures to address worker dissatisfaction with their salary deductions. They could involve uh, making sure they understand and have informed consent about what will be deducted from their salary once they arrive in the host country, as well as um, measure to an option to look into how to reduce the reduction as well. Um, we also want to make it easier for workers to change employers. Now this is, th there are pilots and there are existing arrangements that allow employers to share workers, which means workers can work for more than one employer. Um, however, this has been demand driven, as in driven by the demand from the employers, not driven by the demand of the workers. So giving them a bit more agency and flexibility there would be beneficial in improving their welfare. Um, and lastly, we want to, Im we would suggest improving health insurance coverage, in particular on pregnancy and dental problem, because that's the most common health problem that they have reported. Um, and finally, we want to recommend pri prioritizing data, transparency, and learning to inform policy making and the design, the improvement of these schemes going forward. In particular, we would strongly recommend conducting regular surveys of workers, their families, and the employers as well, as we have been doing and we will try to do it further. Um, we want all those data de-anonymized, I'm sorry, de-identified and made publicly available for researcher to use. Um, not just researcher, but anyone who is interested in this space to use and cross-validate and, and use for different purposes. Um, we will also hope to have a centralized worker contact database. This will help for outreach and communication work with worker, especially in times of crisis, such as during COVID-19, as well as for um, managing and, and improving worker welfare going forward. Okay, so last word. Um, the research team want to, want to acknowledge and thank the time, effort, patience, and support from a large number of individuals and entities who has made this survey and this study possible. That include thousands of our household and, 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 and worker respondent, our survey field teams who are local teams, um, our partners, especially the labor sending units in the, the sending country, national statistic office, public servants, the PLF, 
um, employers in both Australia and New Zealand who has been very generous with their support, um, community, community organizations um, who all have made this survey, um, the project possible. Okay, so thank you. This is my last slide. <laughs> By the way, to a website with all the link to our reports. Fantastic, thank you so much. So can we have you and Ryan come to the front? <coughs> that was uh, incredible. Uh, I think probably the findings were surprising to a lot of people. I live in Malaysia and we have approximately two million uh, migrant workers that come from a whole variety of countries across Southeast Asia and South Asia. And I really wonder if you did a survey like that there, whether you would get similar findings. So I know, um, I'm sure there's questions. I'm gonna just kick off with one looming question that I've heard several times. You know, are the findings at odds with recent concerns on social impacts from migrant sending communities? And if so, why might that be the case? Um, so I guess the, the punchline that we deliver, that the, ma the, the majority of the workers are happy, they are satisfied, everything seems positive. Um, we stand by that finding. Um, the overall pictures that we see is a positive picture. However, as I presented just now in all of those graphs, there is a minority, sometimes a considerable minority, who are not happy, who are not satisfied, who raise concern about the adverse impact or implication of this scheme on themselves or on their family or on their communities, and they should not be ignored. Um, I think this speaks to the concern from sending countries that has been increasing and getting louder in the recent months and years, as well as from um, some qualitative research that look into impact of uh, family separation, for example, or the risk of um, sexual harassment on female workers while they are in the host country. So I do, I do not think that our fighting are at odds with those existing concerns. In fact, we do validate those concerns by showing it both through numbers as well as some of the quotes that I presented earlier from our in-depth qualitative interview. But what we want to do with this sort of study is to have an a bird eye view of balanced pictures from a thousand for many thousands of point of data to see how things have been there out there on average for a large number of workers before delving into the other minority part that that face problem that raise concern and those concerns need to be addressed so so I do not want to present the picture as either black or white good or bad it is a mixed picture um, but overall it is a it's a positive story and that's why the key message that I want to, to you, the audience, to take home is that do not throw out the baby with the bathwater. The baby is good, fix the bad water, but don't throw the baby away. Ryan, do you want to comment on that or happy with the answer? I'm very happy with that answer. <laughs> do we have any questions? Well, okay, let's, there's one, two, three. Let's take those three first and then we'll move across the room. <laughs> Thanks. Can you just say your name, please, as well? Oh, okay. Um, I'm Didor from After Sushi. Uh, thanks for sharing these really good uh, findings from a very interesting survey. I just wanted to know if there are any limitations in uh, your approach and methodology, and uh, particularly how do you assess the use of uh, phone survey and asking such a sensitive question such as income, and how voiced that might be? Thanks. We'll take the other two questions and then give you a chance to answer. Hi, thank you. Anna Gibert from Vanuatu Skills Partnership. Um, I, my question is actually um, more at the systemic level as opposed to the um, individual and community level in terms of um, uh, satisfaction. And um, I'm sure you would have, um, you're aware of um, concerns that are being raised by um, partner governments, um, particularly in a country like Vanuatu where population size is relatively small, um, around the impact of um, departing workers, particularly from critical institutions like um, schools and hospitals and aid posts. Um, just whether you're, yeah, just I'd be really interested in, in any comments from um, the two of you in terms of, I know you're, you're 
um, particular research is focusing on that individual level, but whether you have there have been any findings or, or imminent research that will be looking more at the systemic impacts um, on the um, sending countries. Uh, Anthony Bailey, um, I'm an unaccredited Bishlama interpreter and do quite a bit of work with uh, New Vanuatu workers in Australia. So uh, you made the comment there about the system works, you know, but don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. I suppose it's timely that the um, health and safety wellbeing report was from Lindy Kane and Judy Park is out now because they had, I think, what, 32 conclusions and findings of a relatively small survey of um, palm scheme workers. Uh, I, I guess um, I'm, I'm just curious looking at what uh, the way that you're presenting it and the way the research that you're doing is how is that going to inform, you know, not throwing the baby out with the bathwater when, you know, there are some very serious sort of kind of structural issues with seasonal worker experience in Australia, um, particularly with uh, we, you know, interaction with the justice system, I think, which is um, increasing. And uh, it, it does seem to me to be something that we're not really talking about, um, that this kind of post-arrival experience. Um, and so I'm just curious to hear what, what, your, what your views are around how you might um, build that into your research. Thank you for the questions. Ryan, would you like to start? Okay. Okay, so first, on the limitations more generally, I... Th I think Zoom did a really good job at the end of running through sort of the key main ones that we do have up there. Um, on, but you specifically asked about phone surveys, and I think that's right. We'd always much rather do a face-to-face -face than a phone one, and probably a phone one rather than an online one. Um, but we didn't really have much choice here due to the pandemic. We hope to go back to face-to-face -to -face for the next wave. Um, but we did get the Tongan one all done face-to-face, -face, and it was done by basically the same team that did the census, and so we can compare. Um, and that we do see the same thing on Tongan households as we do see on the one that was done to face to face gives us a bit more confidence in the phone survey responses, particularly with response with regard to something like income. Um, on the broader systemic issues, um, you're particularly alluding to say like so-called brain drain concerns and things like that from that other question. Um, I mean, these are, these are t technically, I don't like using the term low-skilled migration programs, but that's what they are. These are not highly skilled migration programs. We're not taking, Australia's not taking doctors, particularly highly skilled ones. And if you look at the distribution of education amongst people who are coming, it's relatively low-skilled low work. Um, but that's a topic that I think needs unpacked a lot more. The speed at which people are sort of migrating out, particularly in countries like Samoa and Vanuatu, is quite high. The social change is rapid, and if you look at other countries that have gone from a lower immigrant share to a higher immigrant share and uh, accordingly higher incomes along that phase, there is social change and there is transition, and these things do come with costs and cha like social change is a process that yeah, d does have effects as it happens. Um, and also the last one was on Judy's and yeah, Judy and Lindy's report. It's, it's fantastic. I would recommend everyone to read it. Um, I, I think we, 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 do, yeah, we, we do see some of that in the data that comes through, both in the qualitative survey and to a lesser extent. In the report, we don't delve down onto individual cases, but the micro data does let you do that, which is what's nice about it. You can go down into subgroups and try and find individuals with, where there's particular issues and problems. But I know from their work as well, that one nice thing about what our survey and the sampling strategy we use, compared to a lot of the other work, is what you'd know in social mm -hmm. science as selecting on the dependent variable. If you're looking at an issue, be that, um, worker issues or challenges or you go in through a crisis centre, you're getting the people that are exposed to the crises. You're not necessarily getting a broad representative picture of what's going on. Um, and I, yeah, I know that, that's how our, our colleagues are doing that work. So I think they, pass, they present complementary pictures to each other that, that fit together quite nicely to give us a Zoom. broader understanding. Um, let me add a little bit to complement what Ryan just mentioned earlier. In terms of the concern about brain drain from, from the sending country, um, so, first of all, these programs are designed to take only low-skilled and semi-skilled workers. Um, so they are not designed to take high-skilled workers. However, <laughs> they, 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 there, are <laughs> there are cases that we have heard of, you know, nurses or government, you know, public employee who signed up to this program and go off. And, and that's where the, the hottest concern from the sending country come from. So there are two options that I can see to address these, this sort of concern. One is to improve the screening process to make sure that the program prioritizes those who are either unemployed, who don't have a job, who are in the low-skill jobs, who are in the sectors that if they leave, they would not affect the local employers and local co 
economy. That's the first thing, improving the screening process to make sure you don't let the high-skilled public servant or doctor and nurses get into these programs. The second thing overall and in, in general to, to address brain drain is to train more in the domestic market. If you train more enough to make sure that you have more supply of skilled workers to overcompensate who those, those who would migrate either through this program or through other channels if they want to migrate, that will increase the skill stock for the domestic market and offset the impact of out-migration. Um, in terms of your question, your concern about the methodology of the survey, indeed, we switched to phone-based interviews because of COVID-19. And as um, in the case of Tonga, for example, halfway through our, our field work there, the volcanic eruption happened and there was a tsunami. We lost contact with our field team for about 10 days, didn't know what happened to them. So we couldn't continue with face-to-face -face anymore. Um, phone survey has limit in terms of how many questions, how long you can go on, and it does limit the, the sort of personal interaction between um, the enumerators and, and the workers. But we compensate for that by design, redesigning the questionnaire, tested the questionnaire, piloted, and all of our field team across all of these countries are local enumerators. So they speak the language, they know the culture, they were trained to know how to ask the question, they follow protocol to to address concern from the respondent when respondent raise you know, uneasiness or concern about the privacy or why they don't want to release certain information. And everything is voluntary throughout the interview. So at some point, say middle of the interview, if the respondent say they don't want to answer something or they want to stop the interview, then we stop there. We do not force them to go through it. Asking income is always sensitive in any sort of survey, whether it's face-to-face -face or phone or, or internet. Um, or internet based and, and that is the sort of issue we had to address by making sure the questions are worded carefully so that it does not make people feel uncomfortable and again because it's voluntary if people give it to us then we receive it if they don't then they don't we, we don't force it okay and as man Brian mentioned earlier the face-to-face -face part that we did in Tonga was done by the survey firm. Essentially, they are the commercial arm of the National Statistics Office. So those enumerators are extremely familiar with the community. They know this sort of question. They did census. They did household income expenditure survey there. And the comforting factor for us is when we compare the Tongan face-to-face -face data with the Tongan phone-based data, we do not see any systematic difference. So that gives us some comfort that at least the phone mode does not jeopardize the quality of the data. Just yeah. One more brief point on the, um, so I don't think this is in the report, um, but we have looked at the data and it might be a topic for a future blog. If you look at the workers and their levels of education and their skills profile and compare, th compare that to non-sending households and people who are not participating, there's not really any difference. They overlap almost perfectly, which suggests that the uh, participation is not particularly skill biased. It's basically as though you were taking anyone from the population, which surprised me because um, I'd expect those with higher skills or better jobs to be more competitive in recruitment because it's recruitment led. But there isn't an inherent massive skill bias. It might be sector specific or elsewhere, but if you look broadly across education and level of education, that doesn't seem to be happening, um, which was a surprise to me as I guess. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Over here, any questions? Okay, Sadhana, and then we'll take two. Sorry to point. <laughs> I'm gonna play devil's advocate. Uh, um, I think from the time I started listening to research on labor mobility, I'd say this is a pretty wonderful piece of work. And, uh, and yes, you do us a great favor by paying us more than we would get paid back at home um, for laboring for you. However, your economy benefits while ours are losing out other than through remittances. In terms of employment rights, how do rights of labor mobility workers, how, in, how do rights of labor mobility workers, rights and salaries compare to that of similar Australian workers? And why can you not recommend that they work labor for you, laboring that Australians won't do, with the same rights and salaries as an equivalent Australian worker would. Because then the, the issues around um, brain drain, etc., would some, somewhat be, um, um, I forget the word, I'm not an economist, mitigated um, by the increased remittances that would go back. Hey, I, I'm not an economist. 
Thank you. So there was two questions over here. And then please, we only have five minutes, so I'll ask you to keep your answers a little bit short as well. Comments short and answers short. Go ahead. Hi. Um, I'm Bridget Grover from DFAT, but former labor economist at the World Bank, so I have a lot of questions. But I'll just ask one methodological question that might be useful for the, the room more broadly. Just if you had any contradictions or um, yeah, disconnect between the qualitative and the quantitative findings, or do they always match up? One more. There's one more question over here. Yes. Oh, hi. My name is Soi Tawan Mianmani. I'm from Laos, independent consultant. Um, my question linked to the methodology and how you involve the local uh, fieldwork team. What were the low, their role? Is only data collector or did they involve in data analysis, report writing? Our conference two days, we focus on local lead and capacity building, long-term engagement with local and if your project have done that, I appreciate that. If not, what was this challenge? And if you have a chance in the future doing the same thing, will you consider include local people more than just data collector? Thank you so much. Thanks. Song, you want to start? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, OK, I'll, I'll go from bottom to up, because uh, the memory is still fresh. In terms of the, ro the role of allow <laughs> the role of our local field teams. So, so there are two parts of the local field team. One is the enumerator teams, which are the local people, they speak the language, they are there, they, they are based in the country. So they are enumerators. Their role is one, to collect the data. Um, obviously, that's their jobs. However, we do involve them in what is an important part of the, the survey design, which is the pilot of the questionnaire. So the pilot involves in, in class practice among the enumerator themselves, and then they go out to ask some real people in the country, and they, they, they ask them to see whether the questionnaire makes sense, people react, how people react to that, whether they understand the question or not, whether it is culturally insensitive, or whether people would just, you know, don't want to talk about those topics. So the feedback from those local teams are really important for us, and they do provide feedback on improving the questionnaire to make sure that it is customized to the local language. So for example, in Tonga, we receive feedback that these category of education level does not exist there, but you should replace it with this. Or this is how the wording happens, um, how the wording should be changed a bit. Otherwise, people would not understand this sort of question in, in the local context. So that's the role of our local field team. And beyond that local field team, we are also involved with National Statistics Office in Tonga and Vanuatu in particular. We do share the questionnaire with them before, um, before implementing the survey. We do get feedback from, as I mentioned earlier, the field team, the survey firm that we hired for the Tonga face-to-face -face survey is a local Tongan firm and it is part is a commercial arm of the National State Office. And the head of that firm is the head of the National State Office. So we got a lot of feedback from that team, high levels in terms of the design of questionnaire, how to choose the samples, how to improve the, 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 the design of the whole survey instrument. Um, data analysis, no. Um, we do not involve local researcher in the crunching of the number just yet. Um, that is something we could consider over time. However, let me emphasize, once the number come in, you know, the analyst does not see names or individual information. We all only see numbers. And, and that's where there is a level of objectivity there because we, we crunch the number, we look at the percentage. Um, but in the futures, it is something we would consider to have um, Pacific research member in the team. Uh, for the contradiction with the quant and the qual result, I can't come up with anything right now on top of my head, to be honest. Um, what I do notice is with a qualitative survey, because it's qualitative, it's hard to, f to break them into numbers. So it's very hard to compare apple to apples. We do see, we do got a lot of quote about serious problem. Say, for example, quote from community members who say there are a lot of br family breakdown because a lot of um, domestic violence because of the scheme, for example. Uh, but how much is a lot? This is the voice from one person. So it's, it's very hard for us to compare um, apple to apple to see whether there's any co contradiction or not. But what we do see is that there is synergy, as you see in, in, in some of the quotes that I presented earlier. The quote that we got, they are both positive and they are negative. 
and they, they spoke to the same issues that we found in the quantitative data in terms of family breakdown. Yes, there are complaints about that, but there are also you know, feedback that family relationship has improved. I'm not sure whether I addressed your question satisfactorily, but happy to discuss more later. Um, I think I forgot the first question on employment rights and salary of workers. I think Ryan would be the best place to, to answer this, given the other work on salary that AAU team has did. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry to kick the ball, Ryan. I'll, yeah, I'll be really brief, but just in de jure terms, the workers get th the same conditions as any Australian worker in, in terms of the law and how it's regulated. Um, and in terms of the support and the regulation, it's more regulated than a lot of the other schemes that are more dominated by Australians. Um, whether in de facto that's the same due to power dynamics and being a migrant, that, that uh, that's probably not, not necessarily the case, but in de jure terms, in terms of legal rights, that, I that is already the case. Um, but is there anything else? Oh, yeah, I'll, I'll comment really briefly on, on your point. I do work in Asia and in the Pacific, and I'd, I'd love to have many, many more um, co colleague PIs um, from, from these countries and from the region that we do, but the market for PhD economists is really thin. It's something that we're constantly working on at the centre and at the college. Do encourage your friends, colleagues and so-and-so if they wish to come and do their PhDs with us um, to join us and to collaborate on projects. Um, on the next phase, it's something we definitely like to do and try and do. Started quite a while ago. I was new back here. It's a small team, as you see, um, but it's definitely something that is front and, front and centre of our minds and something we want to do more of and that we're work, working on almost every day in our work at the centre, so, yeah. Thank, I take the point very seriously and it's important. Um, yeah. Great. Well, unfortunately we have to end, but I want to say thank you for the, the questions were excellent, very probing, obviously could be followed on by many more questions. You know, the great thing about this kind of empirical research and especially a project that's gone on for so long is that, you know, often empirical research generates information that surprises us and responses that surprises us, which is why it's so important. And I think the conversation doesn't stop here. I think you both will continue to write about this. People will ask important questions like, what didn't they ask? What, what additional information could we try to extract from, from this sample size? Um, and what more, can, how, for, how much more and further can we probe into the issue? So thank you all for your questions and for the discussion today. I'm gonna ask you both to, first let's give a round of applause to the panelists. <laughs> and I'm just going to ask you all to sit here for one moment while I just, I get to close the workshop. <laughs> and drinks will follow, I promise. So we're at the end of another successful Australasian Aid Conference um, 2023. And as Cam said at the opening, this is the ninth conference but it's actually our 10th year, and uh, it's really been a fantastic journey. So I'm just curious, we have a half a full room, so I'm curious for uh, how many of you, is this your first Australasian Aid Conference? Wow, okay, that's a lot. <laughs> and is there, uh, how many, is it three or more that you've participated in? Oh, my goodness, that's pretty good too. Okay, and is there anyone here besides Stephen and me <laughs> who have been to every single one? Oh, wow, Terrence. <laughs> well done, and actually Stephen missed last year. <laughs> he was sick, <laughs> but he was online. Um, so as organizers, we are incredibly proud and grateful for the continuous support and talent that this conference attracts from inside and far beyond Australia. But we know that there's always room for improvement, so please don't forget to give us your feedback through the survey, details on the back of your lanyard. There have been so many highlights this year, and I'm sure all of you have key messages that you will take away and ponder further. And I really regret not being able to attend all the panels that were of interest to me, but here are a few thought-provoking sound bites that caught my attention. If it's not locally led, it's not development. Second one, the future face of poverty is the older woman. And the third one, in terms of generative AI, Bias in means bias out. There were many more, but those were three that I noted. This morning I read uh, an article that the Oxford word of the year for 2023 is riz. I'm sure a lot of us in the room will have to look that one up. <laughs> Maybe some won't. 
However, if we were to pick a word for the Australasian Aid Conference 2023, I think it would be localization. So now I just want to take a moment to thank all of the people who have contributed to the success of this event, from the AV folks to the caterers, the interpreters, and even the fire brigade, uh, <laughs> who made sure that we are fed, safe, connected, and included. And thanks especially to our sponsors, APT Associates, ABC International, ACIAR, ACR, Cadmus, DT Global, Conrad Adenauer, Stiftung Australia, SMEC, and Susinio. And of course, a big thank you to all our participants, our speakers, our chairs who have traveled near or far to be here with your inquiring, learning, and knowledge sharing mindsets. And finally, I'd like to express my gratitude to the staff uh, of the uh, Development Policy Center and the organizing team, uh, especially, and I'm going to name people, so don't applaud till the end. <laughs> Stephen, of course, Cam, Estelle, Vanessa, Amiga, is that correct? Amita, sorry, type, it's the spell check. <laughs> Amita, Evie, Alyssa, Pip, Ato, Jida, Chloe, King Tao, David, Moses, Adam, Haley, Peter, and many others who have pulled off this enormous effort. Thank you so much. <laughs> Hopefully it's not raining. Please join us outside the courtyard for drinks and see you next year. <laughs>